Okay. Great. The recording has started. We will pray. Please also pray for Charles's uh, father. Could somebody lead us in a word of prayer? Then we will get into our session for today. I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise, acknowledge your holy name, Father. At this moment, we come unto your throne of grace. Father, we are dedicating ourselves, past man, say at this moment, for this wonderful class, Father. Lead us, teach us, and mold us into your image. Uh, Father, serving you wholeheartedly, Father. Uh, lead us to your Holy Spirit, Father. We are praying for the Charles, Father, um, who is actually feeling not and uh, over the uh, over the past some days he is in father you're praying that your complete healing and divine healing shall become upon him right away father we are praising you father we are pleading you in the name of jesus give him complete healing uh, lord uh, so that he can come up and give uh, your testimony father and all people shall be um mesmerized and and give you all glory and honor thank you father for healing him right away and uh, uh, thank you for hearing our prayer. Uh, I ask this prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Prabhakar. So in the last class, we had stopped at uh, Acts chapter 10, and we saw how beautifully God led Peter, who was such a devoted Jew, and he wouldn't do anything that was... Uh, uh, you know, not anything against the Jewish traditions. Uh, but, you know, there was this invitation to visit Cornelius, a centurion who was also a Gentile, and to minister the word of God, to share the gospel, and um, subsequently minister the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, Peter, of his own will, would never have done such a thing, but we saw how the the vision that God gave him clarified to him that all people need to hear the gospel. And now uh, that the Lord Jesus had uh, paid the price for us on the cross of Calvary, the gospel was meant to reach the ends of the earth. And so uh, a, a different community was not a limitation. So seeing this vision uh, yes peter initially did not have an interpretation but the way the circumstances were orchestrated he got the message almost immediately he had some men standing at the um, gate at uh, the the tanner's house uh, and from there he was led uh, by those men to Cornelius's house. Another very beautiful uh, incident that encouraged Peter and helped him know that what had happened right now was really the will of God and really, uh, uh, you know, something that God intended to do is the fact that while Peter was sharing uh, about the Lord Jesus, even without laying of hands, now we know that in the book of Acts, we've seen earlier, uh, we've seen uh, in Acts chapter 8, you know, when when uh, uh, Peter and John come to minister in Samaria, uh, Simon the sorcerer, he sees that by the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit uh, is, is uh, 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 you know, poured upon people. Uh, but then here there is no laying on of hands as well so just while the word is being spoken people are baptized with the holy spirit so can such a thing happen today yes so uh, uh, commonly it is through the laying on of hands but even if there is no laying on of hands the baptism in the holy spirit can be administered okay so that is something we have to note down uh, and the other very crucial point here is that uh, first the baptism in the Holy Spirit takes place, and after that, you know, Peter says, if God uh, uh, poured out His Spirit and baptized them, you know, we shouldn't stop baptizing them in water. So He takes the next step, and these people are baptized in water. So we see how the the uh, order 
is slightly different because in the other instances earlier on, we saw that people first believed in Jesus, they were baptized in water, then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in this situation, it's the other way around. So when people ask us the question, they say, oh, uh, should we wait for some time for the believers to become more mature, you know, whatever mature means uh, to, to them. Uh, but should we wait for some time before people are baptized in water or people are baptized in the Holy Spirit? But when we see the accounts in the book of Acts, all of these are almost immediate. So uh, water baptism, if you recall the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, uh, Philip shares the, the gospel with him and they see you know, a, a, a water body and almost immediately he's baptized in water. And now again, Cornelius's household, they accept Christ. And in this situation, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit first uh, and almost immediately they're baptized in water. So there is no time gap as such that we notice in uh, a believer being baptized either in water or in the Holy Spirit. Uh, unfortunately, in some settings, some churches, uh, people have certain rules. Now, obviously, after uh, learning what we have learned just now, we know it's not from the Bible. Uh, you know, these rules say that a believer must come to church at least for six months. And the pastor has to observe whether, uh, you know, the believer is uh, uh, really committed and all that. And only after that, you know, uh, they can be water baptized. They can, uh, they can, you can pray over them for Holy Spirit baptism. But uh, actually, there is no such requirement. Uh, of course, we understand the need to ensure that someone is a believer that they have truly accepted Christ. That is understandable. So we wait till someone uh, makes that confession and uh, can, can uh, genuinely through their lives also show the fruit of salvation. So that is completely understandable. But to put a uh, standard rule on everyone and say that, you know, oh no, you have to wait for a year, or you have to wait for six months, or you have to wait for this and that, uh, it's not something that we observe in the Bible. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Acts chapter 11. Uh, yes, uh, Shri Kumar. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I just want to know uh, regarding to the baptism. Yes. Um, uh, this is one thing which uh, um, I, I just want to know that when the apostles um, were praying um, in the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit came, so um, and that was the beginning of uh, the, the, the beginning of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, but they were the decide, they were actually took the baptism of John not the baptism of Jesus. So is it possible that uh, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they took the, as you said, that they took the baptism in the name of Jesus or they took uh, a baptism of Jesus before the, before the Holy Spirit came? I just want to know that. Hope you understood my question. Yes, yes, I did. Your, so your question is about the water baptism? Yes, because the, they were the uh, they were actually took the baptism of Jesus, John. Mm, mm. They were took the baptism of John. Yeah. But uh, they were after the, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is it possible because that they have took the baptism of in the name of Jesus? That okay. or yeah, that is my question. Or before they uh, they 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 sat. But for uh, te, for those ten days before they gone, um, uh, they took the baptism of Jesus uh, in the name of Jesus, whatever Jesus said, in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's my question. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Okay, thank you, uh, Shri Kumar. So we don't see any uh, like scripture that tells us that they were baptized in water in the name of Jesus. Okay, uh, but here is an assumption. Okay. So what I'm going to share with you, it's an assumption. Seeing how in Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up and preached, and when 3,000 people responded, their immediate action was, uh, you know, we, we also see that they baptized those many people on the same day. So 
it just shows that they were obedient to the uh, this uh, command of baptism as well so it is likely that they were baptized before the day of pentecost because they are being obedient to baptize uh, new believers you know, from that day of pentecost onwards so it's likely that they themselves were also obedient to this practice earlier on so again this assumption is after the lord jesus died he was resurrected my guess it's just a guess my guess is that see john 20 we read that jesus breathed on them and said receive ye the holy spirit so that is the moment of the disciples being born again because they were not born again you needed jesus to uh, you know complete the work of redemption for anybody to be born again so the disciples also were not born again till jesus you know rose from the dead so once jesus rose from the dead and we see that account in john 20 where he says receive with the holy spirit the disciples were born again so somewhere between that period and the day of Pentecost, my guess is that they were water baptized. Yes, thank you, Pastor. That's yes. Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, good question. Thank you, Sri Kumar, for that uh, question. So, uh, any anything else before we move on? Also, yes, yes, uh, brother. Uh, just a uh, uh, view. Yeah. Uh, when disciples were, uh, Jesus breathed into the disciples and told them to receive the Holy Spirit. Was there a need for them to be baptized since Jesus himself has baptized them in the Holy Spirit? Whether there was a need for them to be yes. baptized physically in the water. Okay. Got it. Got it, brother. Thank you for that uh, question. So the way we look at water baptism is, uh, see, even though there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, uh, there is also the baptism in water. And even in the Great Commission, you know, Jesus said that. He said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he meant water baptism. Uh, now, along with that, we said in Acts, we see the apostles doing it. So it sets a precedent for the the uh, you know the growing church in the coming centuries to follow uh, what is being done in the early church. So Acts apostles did it. We see Jesus commissioning the disciples to go do it. So he never said uh, you know just. Uh, let people believe in your preaching and that is enough. He did mention baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit where he's referring to water baptism. So it becomes a command. It becomes a command. And if we go back and look at the life of Jesus, we also see that Jesus himself, now he was the Son of God, the baptism of uh uh, John was a baptism of repentance. So looking at the life of Jesus, when we study the book of Hebrews, we understand that he was perfect in every way. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So being a sinless individual, there was actually no need for Jesus to take the baptism in water for repentance. But scriptures tell us that he did it so that obedience may be fulfilled. So just some scriptures for us to understand that there is a spiritual importance of water baptism. And in the book of Corinthians, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says that the baptism in water is, uh, is a picture of you know, death, burial, and resurrection. So he points out the way Jesus died we go into the water, we die to our own selves, we die to our sins. And the way Jesus rose up, we come out of the water. So it's also a picture of the new life in Jesus. So having all these things in mind, we can be clear about one thing. Yes, there is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but that does not mean that the baptism in water, uh, uh, you know, stop being important after baptism in Holy Spirit came. So 
uh, that's what brother manohar we continue with both i, I got so, it got it yeah so i was yeah. asking specifically for the disciples not for yeah. others yeah for, for, for them disciples. also for them oh, yeah. also uh, since because, jesus himself was baptized yes there you go yeah yeah, yeah. that is the reason that's true. true true thank you yeah. thank you sure thank sure you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Yes, uh, say. Uh, we can't hear you, say. Could you please yeah. unmute yourself? Yeah. Hey, can you hear me, Pastor? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear now. We can hear yeah, now. Yeah. Can hear now. Yes. Yeah. Mine is just an observation from our discussion on baptism by water. I, I think the importance of the spiritual emphasis of why we do baptism hasn't really been explained well in the light of our experience in Christ. And I think that's why there is so much debate and confusion. I'm not talking about here in class, I'm just talking in the body of Christ generally, is that we have not really brought it down to the context of what, how it relates with Jesus Christ, his death, resurrection, and its spiritual implications. So I think that's why most times people don't really see the relevance, you know, in water baptism. So I, I just wanted to say that it would be very important, you know, for us, you know, to explain it in the light of Christ so that people can see the spiritual meaning and why they have to do baptism, water baptism. Just my observation. Thank you. Thank you, Say, for uh, sharing that. I understand, um, you know, your point of view. I would... Um, also like to share that there is an APC publication. It's called as uh, What a, Bap a Baptism. So it covers most of what I shared and much more than some of the points that uh, I made in the class, more than that. So uh, I would recommend that all of us read it. Uh, not just that, there is a publication on Holy Spirit baptism as well. So both of these are available. And before our uh, water baptism sessions here in Bangalore, we give these, uh, we give the uh, water baptism book to all the people who sign up for water baptism. Uh, we, we, uh, we encourage them to go through it, ask questions, clarify, settle matters in their mind before they even you know, take that next step to be baptized in water. So uh, that is uh, helpful. And uh, we've seen that, you know, the step is very helpful. So if you would like to use that book, you're most welcome to just download it uh, from our website and use it. So that'll, that'll uh, equip people in the word. Okay. So yeah, a quick note there. And uh, we can now move forward with Acts chapter 11. So Acts chapter 11, uh, so far we understood, you know, what happened uh, to Peter and how God caused him to step out of the box. So, you know, knowing Peter's personality, uh, he was, uh, you know, like, like a very dedicated Jew who would not break the Jewish traditions uh, and, uh, you know, so and, and he wanted a good reputation with the Jews as well. But for him to actually visit a Gentile was a very, very big deal. But we see how God softened Peter's heart. And he did something which was quite different, uh, you know, from his uh, original or his old convictions. So that's uh, that's what we see at the end of Acts chapter 10. Now, in 11, uh, it begins, the script, the portion begins by saying that now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them so just as much as uh peter is very convinced that you know this ministry is only for uh the jews the gospel is only for the jews the other apostles were also convinced about the same thing so when they heard this good news that the gospel had gone out to the gentiles instead of rejoicing in it what do we read there we read that this report 
caused contention or the apostles of jerusalem questioned peter and you know they they were unhappy about the fact that um, they were unhappy about the fact that peter went to minister to the gentiles okay so they say something like you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them so eating uh, in that culture was a symbol of close fellowship so you couldn't just eat with a gentile you know that that was uh, that was disgraceful uh, but peter did it okay uh, now when he was questioned in this manner from verse 4 onwards you know we we uh, read on uh, uh till about verse 17 and we see that peter actually narrates he's just narrating the incidents that took place you know whatever i shared how he had this vision and uh, uh you know he saw all the animals four footed animals uh Uh, they were they were brought before him and then god spoke to him and he said god said that you must not uh, uh, you know consider what god has don't consider the common things as uncommon okay so uh, so he gets this vision and how there were men standing outside so basically it's a narration of what exactly happened so it's kind of a repetition and then uh, he goes with the men of cesarea uh, and uh, you know he goes and he ministers to to cornelius's household and then he shares uh, how uh, the holy spirit fell upon these people and then you know he also uh, goes ahead and baptizes them in water uh and uh, he justifies he justifies what happened so in verse 17 if he says if therefore god gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the lord jesus christ who was i that i could withstand god so you know it, it basically he's just passing the blame on if 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 you could put it this way on god and saying don't be upset with me god did it you know god is the one who baptized these gentiles so how could i uh, uh, stop the work which god himself was doing so in verse 18 we see how the apostles who uh, had a mindset you know jewish mindset at least they were open to see the work of god you know sometimes what happens we get stuck in our old ways and we're not open to receive the new moves of god was there provision for a move like this or a work like this in the cross yes there was because god had already spoken and told abraham through you i will bless the nations of the world and you know we know uh, even in acts 1:8 yeah, that you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the world which includes people of all nations as we read other scriptures in the old testament you know uh, in uh, isaiah 52 the last uh, verse there isaiah 53 we see there that the work of jesus's redemption was for all men for all men so there was nothing new in what was taking place but it's just that the jews were very stuck uh, in in their own mindset and traditions and it was first of all it would have been very hard for peter to obey uh, this instruction from god you know to minister to the gentiles but god did it through a vision god did it now for the others other apostles it's becoming very difficult to accept what peter did uh, uh, but you know he narrates the story but in verse 18 the beautiful thing is their hearts were open so verse 18 says when they heard these things they became silent and they glorified god saying that god has also granted to the gentiles repentance to life isn't that beautiful that the the people the apostles are willing to accept change they're willing to accommodate you know the the way god is moving so sometimes that is the hindrance uh, in in our lives and in our ministries we are just used to the past ways when god is moving differently and whenever you know i say differently or new revelation i don't mean things outside 
of the revealed will of God and the revealed purpose of God. No, not at all. We know that the Holy Spirit is always in agreement with the word of God. You know, 1 John 5, 7. However, there can be a different way that, you know, God um, shows his works. There, there can be a different approach which God takes because he's a God, uh, you know, you can't box him in one method. So our openness to the ways of God, it's, it's very crucial. If we uh, are not open, then the new thing that God is doing, you know, we will not be able to uh, move forward with it. We will not be able to see uh, the growth that God is bringing in and uh, all of that. So a soft heart, an open heart to the ways of God is important. In this case, praise God for the apostles because they were willing to accommodate the new moves of God. So when Peter told them, scriptures tell us, verse 18, they became silent. They were fighting initially, but they became silent. And they glorified God. They could appreciate the good things that God was doing in the lives of the Gentiles. And you know they accepted the fact that God is granting uh, Gentiles repentance to life. So let's move on from here. Uh, Kishan, I can see your hand raised. Do you have a question or is that by mistake? Okay. Uh, if you have a question, please unmute and ask. All right. Uh, seems like, you know, that, that happened by mistake. Okay, let's move on. So. We're at verse 19 here. After uh, you know this incident of the gospel opening up to the Gentiles, we see that uh, let's not forget we are still in the times of persecution. You no, know, we we saw how uh, Saul himself was a persecutor. So persecution is ongoing at this moment. Okay, even though uh, there wasn't anything specific that mentioned it. So now suddenly Luke brings that in in verse 19. And he says, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. So the believers, they were doing what they knew to do, uh, and, and that is to preach the gospel to the Jews. Uh, so during persecution, one of the things that happens is people flee for safety and, uh, uh, you know, uh, for just just to find another, another place where they can dwell and continue on with their lives. So it generally happens during times of persecution. And something similar happened in the book of Acts. So when persecution was increasing, people started moving to safer uh, places. Uh, and as some uh, you know, regions are mentioned here, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Uh, and the good thing, however, is that people moved, but they continued preaching the gospel. Okay, they continued preaching the word. Um, and yes, their thinking was limited. They still thought that it was only meant for the Jews. But the good part is they were ministering the word. Okay, So think about it today. You know, we as believers, wherever we go, do we carry the word with us? You know, sometimes uh, as believers, we we are just used to going to church and you know having that whole routine uh, a very church routine but sharing the gospel with others uh, may not come uh, you know naturally or we may not have been equipped in our churches to to share the word wherever we go but look at these believers you know persecution we saw earlier that persecution did not stop the spread of the gospel uh, as Gamaliel said it just continued because this is a work of God and no man can put a full stop to what God is doing and right now in Acts 11 we see persecution made people scatter but the beauty is these believers were the kind who followed the Great Commission. Wherever they went, you know, even persecution, pushing people to, you know, maybe not so prosperous regions. One 
thing it has ended up doing that we notice in acts 11 is the church is being built in new places so wherever these believers go churches are being established so that's the point so today is that a reality you know in our communities wherever we go wherever we go for work you know today more than ever we travel the globe uh, we you know people have jobs uh, in different countries and a couple of years they move to another country but wherever we go do we carry the word you know are 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 people blessed by the gospel are are people giving their lives to jesus these are questions we have to ask because when we look at the uh, book of acts that is how the people were wherever they went they shared the word uh, and verse 20 but some of them were men from cyprus and cyrene who when they had come to antioch spoke to the hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. So here we see that eventually, eventually, you know, there, there are people who also begin to minister the word to the Greek speakers. Okay, so the Greek speaking Jews. So uh, they come to Antioch and in this place, they begin to minister to the Greek speaking Jews. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So when you look at this church of Antioch, this church of Antioch, you would, as you study, you would notice that it was predominantly a Gentile church as well. Okay, so uh, that is something that that history reveals to us. It was predominantly a, a, a Gentile church, and who was it started by? You know, again, the beauty of this is it just says there were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Who are these men? What are their names? What is their calling? You know, where they people in the fivefold ministry offices? We have no uh, solid or concrete. Uh, uh, information you know about these matters so we can assume that normal believers were planting powerful churches the church of antioch is a really powerful church and that is the reason luke makes a mention of this church but again it was not planted by a peter or a john or a james or you know philip none of the apostles it just says there were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, some ordinary men, just that they were believers. And they were fulfilling the Great Commission through their lives, whether they had a position in the church or not. Okay, so that's the beauty of this. Ordinary people, wherever they went, they were sharing the gospel and others were giving their life to Christ. And in the case of Antioch, you know, a church was established. A church was established. And verse 21, it says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. You know, that's what every church needs, the hand of the Lord upon us. And when the hand of the Lord is upon us, you know, we will see that uh, there will be a great growth. And the church of Antioch is a beautiful example. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. So it was a growing church. It was a thriving church. So this church of Antioch, uh, it is, uh, you know, in present day Turkey and in in the Bible, you will also, like even in the book of Acts, you will come across another Antioch uh, when we study about Paul. So don't get confused. So there is the Antioch of Pisidia or Sidia, some you know, some peace silent. Uh, and there is the Syrian Antioch. So this Antioch that we're talking about is the Syrian Act Antioch. Okay, so Syrian Antioch. It uh, currently it is in uh, the present day nation called as Turkey. So back in the days uh, when uh, the early church you know, existed. Uh, the population of this this city of Antioch was quite huge. Okay, there were there were lots of people, but apparently now in the in the present day, uh, it it has a smaller number of people dwelling there. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit uh, about the city of Antioch, and uh, you know 
if you want to study much more uh, about Antioch, you could do that, you know, based on uh, like who established it and uh, things like that. Yeah. So uh, it is said that it was established in 300 BC by uh, Seleucus I, one of the inheritors of Alexander the Great's empire. Okay. And uh, he liked to make a city and name them after his father Antioch so that's the reason you know you have uh, many Antiochs uh, so we have to be careful when we when we talk about an Antioch which Antioch are we talking about so this city is Syrian Antioch or uh, apparently it's also called as Antioch of the uh, or Orontes. okay so uh, a little bit of information for us there about Antioch okay let's move on now this church of antioch we 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 will see the importance uh, of this particular church firstly we said that uh, some normal believers they planted the church and uh, in verse 22 uh, you know how the base church or the mother church in jerusalem always received reports of new churches and churches that were doing well so in verse 22 we notice that the church of Jerusalem hears about the church of Antioch. So verse 22, then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So this again is a very common practice. We see that whenever there are new churches, the church of Jerusalem ensures that you know, they, these new churches are established with strength. So remember the church of Samaria, when Philip went and he was having good ministry there, immediately Peter and John were sent. They ministered the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Similarly, the, the church of Jerusalem thinks that, hey, we have to impart what we know to this church of Antioch. So even today, you know, it's a biblical practice that when we see a, a, a church, a new church, you know, leadership, leadership has to think, wow, you know, God is doing a good work here. God's hand is upon this new church. And, uh, yeah, you know, um, many people are being added to this church. Spiritually, what is it that the Holy Spirit wants us to impart to this new church so that we may be, we may establish this new church? You know, that's a mindset that we must carry you know, instead of having a competitive uh, mindset or thinking, oh, they are growing, they are doing better than us. Uh, the Church of Jerusalem had that motherly heart for all the new churches. So they, they were looking at uh, what is it that they could contribute to strengthen a new local church. So they asked the same question here. What can we do for Antioch? And so they immediately sent Barnabas. Remember Barnabas, a rich man, Levite, a generous man, a giver. Uh, okay, and uh, he's also known as a good man, a good man, good testimony, uh, a son of encouragement. So here is a good, um, you know, minister of God whom they sent to the church of Antioch. So verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the lord so you see how encouragement works you know church to church uh, uh, more established church to a uh, growing church there is encouragement so barnabas comes he sees the good work and he encourages them and he says come on you know you need to keep going strong uh, so that the purpose of god can be accomplished in all of you and you know sometimes we need that we need that encouragement as we are uh, you know in this race uh, of of life verse 24 for he was a good man full of the holy spirit and faith and a great many people were added to the lord so when barnabas goes to his ministry uh, once again we see the fruit of that uh, that many people are added to the church uh, yes ashri kumar you have something to ask yes pastor i just want to know uh, as you said that the church encouraged the church and uh, you know and they imparted to the other church but today if you see um, there are churches even though they wanted to impart something but they got god, god has given to them 
maybe it is a grace of prophetic or a grace of um, something which um, God is um, really bless them and God is God is uh, you know um, stored in them and if they wanted to uh, impart to someone's life but they charge so much that uh, you know uh, which is sometimes beyond uh, you know a normal man's um, approach like for example if you have to attend a three days prophetic conference you have to give some somehow some one lakh two lakh Indian currencies to to get that uh, one day or one and a half day meeting and uh, so many other places they charge so much to receive that which God has given to them uh, I think of, uh, maybe that is the reward of their faithfulness or so how you think about it because these things when I see uh, you said that it is an encouragement but sometimes I get discouraged because of this thank you pastor I that was because thank you yeah yeah thank you uh Sri Kumar. i i know where you're coming from and it is a reality uh that you know sometimes these conferences where uh, we can receive something from the lord are quite expensive so my take on it is um see uh if if an organization uh, charges or let's say a church they charge something reasonable so when i say reasonable see if there is a conference and uh, um, you know the running costs can be quite high in some of the cities so if if uh, people are charged for their stay for uh, their food and uh, you know things like that uh, and these are reasonable charges uh, i don't see anything wrong with you know reasonable charges you know comparable with like a very basic budget way of yeah, uh, yes. living everything can affordable then that is yeah the, affordable is very beyond the affordable thing then it's when you see what is one lakh rupees or one and a half lakh rupees so yeah. then it's quite uh, <laughs> right, that's yeah right. yeah yeah so that is understandable and uh, as far as i'm concerned acceptable but uh, what you're sharing is you know there are some charges which are way too high um i don't know how to justify that i really don't yeah it's is, is that okay in the god size or uh, is it that's as far as i can see see like if our intention is to have many people joining then how can they join shri kumar if they have to spend so much but are they wanted to uh, cut short the people, the number, and they only wanted to give to the special people who can able to afford? In that case, the people who don't have money, how they will? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it depends on their goal. We yeah. cannot judge the motive of their correct, heart. Correct, correct, correct. Because God is using them in that way. We <laughs> cannot judge them that way. Because absolutely, they are actually in different. God is, <laughs> God is Yeah. Different yeah uh but yes somewhere uh you know charging people so much for conferences and uh programs it is unreasonable you know because like okay even if you have if you want only a small group to attend um yeah if they specify that then i think it's kind of justified but if you want a lot of people to attend and the charges are high then i don't see how they will be able to uh, fulfill their their goal of you know, ministering to a lot of people and uh, brother manoha here uh, shares that uh, jesus said freely you have received freely give but reasonable charges are quite okay okay so i think he has summed it up beautifully right there wherever possible it is nice if we can give uh, things freely so as some of you know here at APC uh, the publications the printed copies uh, they're all free so even recently you know we uh, for for the missions events um, bulk a huge bulk of books were sent out it's free of charge because uh, that is something that is one area where we feel if people can have access to the books the word of god it will change their lives so wherever possible it's good to make it free uh, but we do understand that everything uh, you know may not be practical you know, to keep it free so as brothers put it reasonable charge you know, something to do with the running costs of an event makes complete sense okay thank you pastor sure
Thank you. Thank you, Shri Kumar and uh, Brother Manohar. Uh, let's take a break. Uh, we will come back and uh, continue with, with our uh, subject here. Thank you. We'll meet at 10.02.